The service will be beginning, will be beginning shortly. Uh, if you have not yet accessed the order of service, you can do that by the QR code, which is on the poster at the back of the cathedral. This is to tell you about something slightly different at the end. Uh, we are conscious that this is the choir's last event of the year. They actually finished term yesterday. So the boys are on double time today, uh, extra sweets and all sorts of other things. We don't want to keep them any longer from their holiday than we have to. So we are suggesting that at the end of the service, uh, the clergy will process out as usual. And once the voluntary is finished, the choristers can go, which means the parents who are here can go as well and take them uh, home to watch television and things. Uh, the point of that, that, of telling you that then, is that we will then, the bishop and uh, the archdeacon and others, we will come back in for the presentations. So the choir can be released, relieved, and whatever else, uh, and not have to sit through the presentations. So don't go unless you are with a chorister who want to go home early. If you want to pretend to be with a chorister, <laughs> that's not allowed, I'm afraid.
Good evening. Welcome to Llandaff Cathedral. Welcome to this choral even song to mark Archdeacon Peggy's retirement. And a particularly warm welcome to members of Archdeacon Peggy's family who have travelled to be with us today. Beloved in Christ, we are here in the presence of the living God and of the whole company of heaven to offer to him, through our Lord Jesus Christ, our worship, praise, and thanksgiving, that we may know more truly the greatness of his love and that his grace may bear fruit in our lives. We have come to hear and receive God's holy word, to seek the strengthening power of the Holy Spirit, and to pray for ourselves and all mankind that we may be given those things which are necessary for our true well-being. First, let us confess our sins and seek our Father's pardon and peace. We confess to God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. Wherefore, we pray God to have mercy upon us. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us all our sins, and deliver us from evil. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. O Lord, open thou our lips. O God, make speed to save us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. sit by the choir chants, part of the appointed Psalm 118.
Daw'r llith gyntaf o'r wythfed bennod ar hygen o lyfr Genesis gan dechrau yn yr unfed adnod ar ddeg. A daeth i rhyw fan ac aros noson yno gan fod yr hael wedi machlyd cymerodd un o gerrig y lle a'i gosod a'n ei ben a gorweddodd i gysgu yn y fan honno. Breddwydiodd a'i bod yn gweld ysgol wedi ei gosod ar y ddeiar, a'i phen yn cyrraedd i'r nefoedd, ac yng ngylion diw yn dringo ac yn disgyn ar hyddi. A safodd yr arglwydd gerllaw iddo a dweud, Mae fi o'r arglwydd diw Abraham dy dad a diw Isaac, rhodd a fy tîr yr wyt yn gorwedd arno i ti ac i thysg yn yddion. Bydd dy hil fel llwch y ddeiar, a byddi'n ymestyn i'r gorllewyn ar fwy rai nac i'r gogledd ar de. A bendithu'r boll deiliaidd y ddeiar yn o ti ac yn dy ddysg yn yddion. Wele, yr wyf i gyda thi a chadwaf di ple bynnag yr ei, a dodd a thi nôl i'r wlad hon, oherwydd nith a dawadd nes i mi wneud yr hyn a ddywedais. Pan ddeffrodd Iacob o'i gwsg dywedodd, y mae'n sicr bod yr arglwydd yn y lle hwn, ac ni wyddwn ni, a daeth arno ofn ac me ddaeth, mor ofnadwy yw'r lle hwn, nid yw'n ddim amgen, na thi ddiw, a dyma borth y nefoedd. Cododd Iacob yn fore, a chymerodd y garreg a fi dan a'i ben, a gosododd hi'n golof, a thawall o lew drosti. Yma terfyn y llith gyntaf.
The second lesson is taken from the third chapter of the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, beginning at the ninth verse. For we are God's servants, working together. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple? and that God's Spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Here ends the second lesson. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Show thy mercy upon us. O Lord, save the Queen. And do thy ministers with righteousness. Save thy people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works to proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, 
and that, being defended by thee from the fear of our enemies, we may pass our time in rest and quietness. For all Jesus Christ, our Lord, Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ.
May words that are sung and words that are spoken and words that are heard be always and only of you, O God, our Creator, our Redeemer, our Sustainer. When I am an old woman, I shall wear purple. With a red hat that doesn't suit me and doesn't go, I shall sit down on the pavement when I'm tired and pick flowers in other people's gardens and learn to spit. As I reach the brink of retirement, I think with Jenny Joseph, maybe I ought to start practicing a little now. After all, other women far more eminent than I have already begun to wear purple. <laughs> I don't think any have quite yet aspired to a red cardinal's hat, but maybe. <laughs> My granddaughter Miller has been trying to teach me to whistle. And grandson Noah to dance the floss. Noah and Miller, uh, I think you and I should get together and together we'll learn to spit. <laughs> to be learning, growing, discovering, of course, that's what it means to be fully alive. And the glory of God is a human being fully alive. That was Jacob's awakening, as he discovered God's purpose for him in the very land where he was lying. Our first reading tonight. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He heard the words of God, which resonated since through every generation to faithful people. Know that I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. Joseph realized God's presence, and so discovered his true self. He realised his true self and in so doing discovered that God had a purpose for him. He was part of a greater story which began before he was alive and would continue eternally beyond his time on the land. That was the learning that brought him to the very gate of heaven. He, a man with a pretty scurrilous past, but now having a place in God's story, a place uniquely his own. What more could any of us wish for? I must confess, when I first came to Clandaff Cathedral, I could never have imagined that God would have any purpose such as bringing me back to this land. It was 1968, as a bridesmaid to my brother's wedding. It was a wonderful occasion, but it was mostly a blur because being very vain at the time, I refused to wear my glasses and I was so short-sighted I couldn't see most of what was going on. <laughs> but it took some 40-odd years later for the truth to dawn on me that God might actually be holding me and be alongside me wherever I went and one day would bring me back down the aisle of this sacred place, surely itself a gate of heaven. Well, learning is at the heart of our awakening to God, because as we learn, our minds and hearts and imaginations are open. God has a chance to touch and to open our eyes. The last 12 years have been a time of huge learning for me. Uh, I'm not just thinking now of the time standing in Valmai's kitchen as I stumble through my Welsh pronunciation. <laughs> I discovered a deep inheritance of faith in this land. From the age of the saints onwards and still held in the ancient stones and wells and pilgrim routes across this diocese. I've been inspired by the stories of women in the church in Wales and their wisdom and understanding of the culture in which they've lived and worked and their ongoing story which began long ago 
and will continue way beyond these few exciting years I've been able to share. I've been fascinated to see how Wales's unique history has coloured the egalitarian nature of this culture, influenced the priorities that we now see setting out, being set out in the Senate and in the Welsh Government today. I've learned from clergy and colleagues on the ground, especially the area deans over many an excellent lunch, <laughs> just what keeps our churches alive and our communities nourished. And this despite the rumours of gloom and financial despondency that sometimes emerge in our church. I've learned from Bishop June how people and situations can be transformed and turned around by just opening eyes to a fresh approach and some new trust. And I've been reminded, if you needed an adage from my, all my adult life, that if you want an enterprise to flourish, you should never put the accountants in charge. <laughs> Keep them in their place. Honoured servants. <laughs> but above all, I've learnt that it's the God who brought me here through odd and extraordinary ways, who has made herself visible in all these people and places, so we can know we are all part of a greater story, which began long ago and will continue well beyond our current generation. It has to be said, St Paul and I have had a pretty mixed relationship over the years. <laughs> I sometimes think if I were to reach the gates of heaven beyond this life, then I think um, he and I would have some pretty tough conversations about some of his pragmatic texts before either of us would be likely to see the other side of those gates. But on this, St Paul was right. It's not the outward embellishments of a building or a life which will decide its future or its value as an expression of truth, but the quality of its foundations. All of us but pass through the land and work on this building site of faith. But whether or not we have any effect or influence that will outlast us or change the world for better depends not on our brilliant minds or our energy or even our determination and willpower. No, it depends simply on how deeply and firmly we are rooted in the continuum of God's presence and God's purpose. If we live to God, then the Spirit will dwell in us and we shall become God's holy temple, revealing his presence to others. And while we can do this as lone individuals, we shall do it better and for the better benefit of people around us if we do it together. That's what Sir Paul knew. That's what we know in our diocese at the moment as we roll out ministry areas. Yes, I had to bring them in somewhere. <laughs> We are servants working together in God's field for God's building. And as we work together, so we will build those foundations deeper, deeper than the constitution of the church in Wales, God bless it. Deeper even than the Llandaff Diocesan strategy, God bless it. Because it will be laid in the unity that Christ brings to his servants. It will survive fire and flood and much more for generations to come. So we should take heart. We should know that the temples that we erect for a short while are not the end in themselves, but only so far as they build on the foundations of the certainty of faith will they survive. If I've been looking for a legacy for my time in Wales, this wonderful period of my life. <laughs> I don't think I shall have a statue like my worthy predecessor up the hill. And they won't name a beer after me. <laughs> Though I hope he enjoyed the fact that my Sir Optimus Club draped him in an orange sash a couple of years ago as a mark of the campaign against violence against women. <laughs> Maybe somebody somewhere might just do a little circle dance and remember and teach that others can do it too, who knows. But 
rather, I think, I think I simply want to say, in homage to dear St Paul, remember the things that you have learnt, received and heard and seen in me, and then go out and do a whole lot better on your own. <laughs> and the God of peace will be with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God of love, we give thanks for the ministry of Archdeacon Peggy. We thank you this evening for all the memories we have of working with her, for the gifts you endowed her with, and for the contributions she's made to this diocese and all the fruits of her faithfulness and service. We pray for her as she moves into retirement. Grant her, Lord, a long, healthy and happy retirement with many new friends and a new area of ministry. We pray for June, our bishop, for all the clergy and readers of the diocese, for lay leaders and all the baptised people of God in this place. Empower us by the gift of your holy, life-giving spirit, that we may be transformed into the likeness of Christ from glory to glory. Amen. Hold in your embrace, dear Lord, all who witness to your love in the service of the poor and needy, and all who minister to the sick and dying, all who bring light to those in darkness, Touch and heal those whose lives are disfigured by sickness and pain. May they be raised from death to life in Christ, and may sorrow and pain be turned to joy. We give thanks for those who have gone before us, for the whole company of the saints in glory. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. And with them in fellowship, we join all our prayers and praises. By your grace, may we, like them, be made perfect in your love. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honour and power be to our God, for ever and ever. Amen. The prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Gracious God, you've given us so much today. Grant us also a thankful spirit. Into your hands we commend each other and those we love. Be with us through this evening. And when we take our rest, renew and refresh us for your service in a new day. To the praise and glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Abendith du ho hachiog, a tard, a mam, a rosprid glan, a bonak please a cadrigo gadachui and wastad. Amen. The Lord be with you.
Uh, I just wanted to catch the choir before they all disappear uh, to say an enormous thank you to them for coming tonight to sing for us, to Stephen and to David in the organ as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. My friends, it's, um, it's my privilege um, to do what I know many people uh, would have wanted to do, um, which is uh, to say thank you and to wish Peggy Godspeed. Uh, it's wonderful to have um, her brother Mike uh, and his wife and uh, her daughter Ali and their family uh, with us on this occasion. Uh, it's, um, it's very special for us to be able to tell you all how enormously proud we are of Peggy and what we think of her. There are not many occasions when families get uh, to hear quite how significant uh, their grandmother uh, is. Um, so it's terrific that you've made the journeys to be with us. Um, I'm very conscious that, as you will be, that not only is Peggy stepping down from the role of Archdeacon of Llandaff, but from a very long, uh, distinguished ministry. And just in case any of you are a bit hazy about the details of this, let me just recap it a little bit. Frances Anne, as she was named, was educated in Leicestershire. She went up to Oxford, to Somerville, uh, to read modern history and uh, modern history, incidentally, begins around about the 12th century. Um, she then spent 13 years uh, first training and then uh, practicing as a chartered accountant. Um, and after those years was ordained in the Derby Diocese, serving a curacy in Ilkeston. Um, she subsequently spent eight years in uh, the St. Albans Diocese in Hemel Hempstead, um, and then 11 years in uh, the Southwark Diocese in Mortlake, um, including five years when she was rural dean, uh, she was dean of women's ministry, and she was an honorary canon of Southwark Cathedral. Uh, all of that experience, all of that uh, uh, parish life brought her then to Wales as our Archdeacon. And so she, as you can tell, she brought with her an immense commitment uh, to the life of parish ministry. And the first five years uh, that she was Archdeacon, she was also priest in charge of Penmark with Llancarvan and Llantrithid. And then she moved to St. Fagans, which is, now, which is now, as we say, in the Garth ministry area. In 2013, she was also acting dean of this cathedral. And way beyond uh, the jobs that we've given her here in Llandaff, Peggy has made her impact on the church in Wales. Uh, she's a member of the Provincial Standing Committee of the governing body, she holds a variety of provincial roles, including uh, the Widows, Orphans and Dependents Committee, a disciplinary tribunal, the dispensation panel. Um, few know better than Peggy does the inner workings of the church in Wales, and she's ending her time as a member of something called the Governance Review Group. Um, I suppose many uh, of you here today uh, will remember her for her contribution to the achievements of women's ministry, especially uh, women bishops. Uh, without Peggy, the move to women in all three orders of our church uh, would have been far less principled and far less theologically coherent. 
So you can tell that as we uh, bid her farewell into her retirement, she has been a faithful servant of the church in ordained ministry now for 34 years, I calculate, Peggy. And for that, we are profoundly grateful. The church owes her. Now, you all here and those um, tuning in will have your own uh, memories of Peggy and your own reasons to be grateful. Uh, but I just want to share uh, some of mine. Um, Peggy, you have been a minister of the gospel with a warm and an empathetic heart. Um, you will all know that Peggy has a hard head. She is intellectually bright, she's quick to see the implications of things. But her heart is soft and she has enormous pastoral imagination. She can see into people's situations and the consequences of things for individuals doesn't escape her. Um, you see an archdeacon who often has to have robust conversations, but we also see in Peggy the parish priest who loves her people, who sometimes fights for them ferociously. Peggy, you've also been a minister of the gospel at a time when ordained women was very new. The church had no previous experience of it. And I want to say to those of you, uh, your friends here that um, you shouldn't underestimate what was asked of that first generation of deacons and priests Peggy spent seven years in deacon's orders, don't forget, because the church uh, was slow and neurotic about uh, getting to priesting them. Um, and th that generation of women had to face a, a constant uh, tension between, uh, do they exercise their diaconal orders, their priestly orders, do they do it just like the men in order to reassure and prove that nothing was going to be different, that they were stepping into an ancient tradition? Um, or do they do it like a woman because it is different and that's the glory of it? Uh, Peggy, um, through all the all the twists and turns of being the first generation of women ordained, you have been both a priest and an archdeacon as yourself. But you have played a role, and I hope you'll think on this uh, a long time in the years ahead. You have played a role in making it easier for those who come after you. And then thirdly, um, you have been a minister of the gospel when leadership itself needed feminizing. Um, you know, in your lifetime, uh, leadership has moved from command and control, um, rather more autocratic, top down, to shared oversight. And we heard that in your sermon. We heard you talk. Uh, you have always worked in teams. It's your absolute instinct. And it has been a joy for me to agree and disagree with you. Um, uh, because she does both with immense probity and passion and team accountability. I, Peggy won't mind me telling you that one of our uh, recent staff meetings she and I got into an argument and we were sitting at uh, socially distanced you understand we were sitting at opposite ends of a room and neither of us were going to let go of this argument it was such fun wasn't it um, uh, a little a little terrifying for those who watch us but uh, uh, you have been a glorious team player. 
So not only the uh, church in Wales has benefited from the coherence of Peggy's leadership, there are many organisations that she's been involved uh, with. Uh, I think of particularly Women's Aid, and I think Rachel Minto, behind some of those... Hello, Rachel. Uh, Rachel, who's the chair of um, uh, Women's Aid, I know uh, will want to um, express to you uh, their thanks, but uh, there are so many who will be glad to see you back as both friend and counsellor um, to them. But it is time to let you go to a new adventure, a new exploration in Hampshire. Uh, you go with our gratitude. You go with God's blessing. You go with us all saying to you, you have been a good and faithful servant. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's express our appreciation of Peggy. for a moment before I hand the microphone over to Peggy we've just got one or two little uh, gifts because there are many people in the diocese who've contributed uh, to um, Peggy's gifts this evening and the it's right and proper that the area dean of Thandaff has got some things to give you in the first instance uh, some flowers and uh, a check uh, which I hope contributes to um, you buying your own flowers and not stealing them from your neighbour. <laughs> and, um, and a photograph of the area deans who you mentioned. Um, but we also have one other, I think we have one other gift that's coming uh, from Mike Lawley. Is Mike here? Yes, there he is. Um, just stay there one second, Peggy, because there's another little something coming. Okay, um, say so apologies about the box, it's not the most photogenic, but uh, I'll explain why it is what it is. Um, Peggy, I, I've been asked to um, give you something from the senior leadership team, of which I'm a member, um, but also things from the DBF and all the, all the groups and organisations you're, you're, you're part of. Um, as Bishop June said, uh, it's great working with you on a, on, a, on, a, on a committee or a board because you're so passionate you challenge, <laughs> but, 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 but you really do work as a team and when we get to an answer, then you, then you go with it. So um, it's, it's really been, been great, for, and so this is on behalf of all those people who work with you. But I'm sure a lot of other people know that um, Peg has another passion, which is flying. And uh, she's got a pilot's license, so when we're all mere mortals digging away in our garden, she's flying around somewhere <laughs> above us and keeping an eye on her. So, when, when, when we came to the senior team to think, well, what are we going to give her if she's going to be able to go away from Plandaff and remember us, but also probably remember her great times here flying. So, Peggy, this, I hope it's in one piece still, but this is something which we hope you will be able to take away as a bit of Plandaff, but for your memories of flying as well. So, please, please hope, but be very careful. <laughs> But it's on a stand. Look at this. Oh, oh my this, word. The, 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 the stand. It's a PA28. <laughs> it, in Clandaff colours. And what's the number on it? PGY Lima Lima Delta Foxtrot. It's Peggy Landaff. <laughs> so hopefully. Oh Peggy, one wheel has fallen off, but the wheel will be put back on this week. <laughs> yeah, did you have a scrumpy landing on that one? <laughs> 
<laughs> Gosh. Well, what can you say? <laughs> it's much easier up there than it is down here, I can tell you that for sure. Um, I don't know. I'm speechless, really. Um, June, thank you so much for your lovely words. I mean, you were absolutely spot on on the history. Um, and actually spot on, I realise, on, on the way in which we've worked together in the team as well. And like Lord Ebre affirms it, um, I have to learn that <laughs> and take it with me in whatever way and wherever God is going to take me next. Um, and of course, it, it is a great adventure, rather like coming to Thandaff. Uh, going to Fordingbridge in Hampshire is somewhere I know nothing at all about the place. It was simply the place the Church of England Pension Board had a house they could rent me. So there's, there's a, a God of surprises at the root of all this and a God of surprises to carry me forward, I think. But I want, do want to say thank you to everybody who's contributed to these lovely gifts. So can, that is going to have pride of place on the windowsill, I can see now uh, where it will be in my new house. Uh, thank you to all those who've contributed um, and who are listening in and who've come today to uh, celebrate this service. And um, w the, the music was absolutely glorious. And I have to say, uh, they gave me a bit of a choice, but Mark put the, uh, the rutter in. It was a bit of a surprise. Um, and actually, the parry and the rutter were two of the anthems at my ordination service in St. Albans Abbey in uh, 1994. So uh, I could not have wished for a nicer way to say goodbye and to hear the organ of Llandaff Cathedral in all its glory um, was just a wonderful experience. So uh, I can't beat that. I'm still here for three more weeks, but I don't know how I'm going to top that one. Um, <laughs> but thank you all so much indeed, and uh, God bless you for all that will be happening in Llandaff. When well, I'm not here to share it, but I'll be watching out and I'll be on the YouTube to keep an eye on everything that's happening here in the years ahead. Thank you.